and a continued happy pride to all. Welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 137, Prime Day, AMA, and Space Base Review. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mochi. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, we're back today with a surprise AMA, followed up with a review of Space Base, a game that we've all enjoyed quite a bit. Then we're going to wrap up with a longer than usual Bellhop's Tabletop, as Sean was in town for his grandfather's 100th birthday, and we met up and got some actual in-person gaming in, together with the whole Belltop team. So we've got thoughts on Riff Raff, Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy, Quetz, Quacks of Quedlinburg. I don't know. That was, I don't usually have a problem saying that one. And Space Base. And let's just see how the uh, closed captioning handled that one. <laughs> Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a couple of quick comments on our Rail Pass review. Dead Accent writes, this game is just a sorting algorithm, and it's fantastic. <laughs> and Board Game Maman said, this one was fun. Ah, uh, thank you both for the comments. A sorting algorithm, eh? You know, I never thought of it that way until reading this comment, and I'm like, it totally fits. I, I, it, th maybe that's why I dig it, right? Because it gives me fond memories of my early days of programming and early comp sci classes and learning, uh, what was it, Turing, I think was the programming language they originally taught us, which of course no one uses nowadays. And I don't even know if it still exists. But yeah, the early, do a bubble sort, do a popcorn sort, do a, what was it, the stack sort or something like that shows how much I now use my computer science degree as well. But yeah, that's basically it, right? It's like here, you have all these cities and they have the wrong cubes, get them to the right city, go. All right, well, up next, a comment on our review of Master Taylor's Poltergeists for Adventuria. Jonathan writes, as I splash coffee around, next, uh -oh. <laughs> Jonathan writes, great job highlighting the Adventuria on-ramp. Do you know if Master Taylor's Poltergeists will be available at retail or some other way? Thanks. Well, thanks for the comment, Jonathan. Now, according to my source, you should be able to get Master Taylor's Poltergeists at retail. The thing is, right now, they're still working to fill the last Kickstarter they had, and that's where the translation of Master Killer's Poltergeist came in. It was a, a backer bonus that was given to everyone who backed the project. And I think they're smart in this case, because I think you've probably all seen how poorly some backers can react if they see things in stores before they get their own personal copies. So Ulysses Spiel is waiting to get the backers fulfilled, and then they'll get out retail versions of Master Taylor's Poltergeist. And I do have to thank Pax the Paladin in our chat room for pointing out heap sort. That was the one I was trying to remember there. I was like, I'm like pile sort. You put everything together. All right, well, a week or so ago, we reblushed our must-have tabletop gaming accessories article and got a couple of comments on that. Sean Hamilton, not me, commented, bowls. <laughs> and Bob Lay wrote to say, Coasters, there's always someone in the group that manages to leave a drink ring on the table or spill their soda beer on the rule book. That being said, coasters aren't foolproof. Some gamers spill things no matter what. Well, thanks, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton and Bob. Uh, I have to agree with Sean here. Bowls or some other method of organizing your board game components is one of the most useful things you can have available in your game room or available for game night. Coasters are a good call too, though, as we've said multiple times on the show before, a much better option is to just not allow drinks on the game table. We use side tables or TV trays or some other spot to hold our beverages. All right, well, next, a comment slash question from our Medium review on YouTube. Gabby writes, Hi, did you have a problem with the crystal ball cards being bigger than the playing cards? I wonder if I got a bad copy because it doesn't make sense to have them bigger than the four decks included. All right, thanks for the comment, Gabby. I am 99% sure what's happening here is that you are confusing the dividers, which have pictures of crystal balls on them, with the actual broken crystal ball cards. 
like the fact you're even noting there's four decks there is way more than four decks or something like 18 decks in there it's just how they're packaged so in those four decks you should be able to find three cards showing crystal balls with cracks in them with the cracks in different spots on each card these are the ones you use when playing to determine when the game ends the large ones are dividers for dividing up the different sections of the different decks now, if that's not the case, maybe maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm misunderstanding, then yeah, something is wrong with your copy, and your best bet nowadays is to return it where you bought it. Or possibly contact the publisher, though to be honest, more and more publishers these days are no longer offering component replacements. They basically switched over to where most places are just like, return it where you bought it. Though it's worth a shot. You may want to reach out to the, the publisher, see if they could send you the replacement cards. It might be cheaper on their end just to send you three cards than send you a whole replacement. All right, well, next, a couple of comments on our topic of dice randomizers like dice trays and towers. Phil Hatfield writes, I made my first tray from a heavy cardboard box that I put a foam bottom and felt down on the bottom. It was small, but quite mobile. It worked for a while, but eventually I picked up one of those heavy-duty hexagonal versions, and it has served me well. I don't take it many places, but I have traveled with it. I picked up one of those Etsy wooden dice trays because of the artwork. I use it sparingly as it is noisy and the mm -hmm. sides are a little shallow. Best one has been and probably always will be the hexagonal one that shows on your list. Mine is the same size and color, good size, sides, heavy enough not to sound like a rattle trap, but not so heavy as to avoid travel with. And then Gene Chu writes, the dice trays I've got off from are from Yahtzee games I bought off thrift stores. They were only a few bucks, much cheaper than buying a typical dice tray or tower. I like using dice trays to keep the dice from rolling onto gaming pieces. Mm -hmm. One time, my friend dropped a die onto a gaming miniature and broke it. Using a dice tray encourages you to roll dice in a place that is safe from accidentally hitting any game pieces on the board or table. Mm -hmm. I also made a custom dice trays plus tower using Lego. I only use it as home as it is rather bulky and fragile to transport. And I mainly use it for war games. So I don't roll dice on the map and dislodge stacks of counters. Well, thanks Phil and Gene for the comments. Uh, what I really like about both of these is that they basically reinforce what we said ourselves on the topic. Um, the hexagonal tray Phil's referencing is from Easy Roller Dice. It's the Easy Roller Dice style tray with a storage area on it, which I really do love and is one of the best I've ever used. I do also dig Gene's idea though of looking for Yahtzee trays at thrift stores and other dice games, like Shut the Box and that. I've seen a number of different ones like that. And there's a particular game and I can't remember the name of it that has a round tray with poker chips in the five corners. I think that would also be another one and thrift stores generally get a good price. This is something I'm gonna have to watch for if we ever actually do return to thrifting again. Thrifting again. I also dig the idea of using Lego, but I do worry that it would be as loud, if not louder than a wooden tray. Lego is not a, um, a quiet material, <laughs> I guess is a way to put it. Absolutely. And I, I think, I don't think we actually did comment much on war games. I mean, again, when you've got a table set up with all your stuff, mm, that's a really good reason everywhere. to have, uh, have your dice trays. Well, finally, <clears throat> we have a very detailed comment about roll and move games from Isaac Quo. I hate roll and move in multiplayer games where it takes a long time to get back around to your turn. Talisman is the prime example because it is an, this is an extremely popular game, but it's only playable with experienced players who can instantly decide what to do and rapidly play out their moves. But when trying to learn the game, it is excruciating waiting for your turn without being able to plan out what you want to do next and only being able to ponder what to do after rolling the die. Before rolling the die, there are too many possibilities to plan out ahead. It's just too much. So you spend most of the game bored out of your skull while waiting for your turn. It's simple enough to repair this, though. Simply roll your move die at the end of your turn instead of the beginning. So it's move and roll. This way, you can plan out what you want to do on your turn, and if something happens during the other player's turns, you can adjust your thinking as necessary. This makes everyone's turn quicker, as they have already been thinking about what they plan to do. It also makes the game more engaging while you're waiting for your turn. Of course, keeping track of a roll for such a long time is non-trivial, so it would be more convenient to use number cards for movement rather than die rolls. 
That way you pick your cards at the end of your turn and you can plan your next turn based on what's in your hand. Whiz War is a perfect example of this. The game that truly turned me off of Roll and Move, though, was Myth Fortunes, based on Myth Adventures. You rolled two dice, and you would move horizontally according to one die, and vertically according to the other die. This resulted in eight possible ways to go, additionally com complicated by stuff which made it matter which direction you moved first. So basically, wow. 16 possibilities, in a way that was hard to visualize. We're talking analysis paralysis every darn turn. Isaac eventually went on even more detail about being forced to move the full results on a die and being able to move up to and how that affects things with a big focus on roll and decide versus decide and roll. Well, thanks so much for the detailed comment, Isaac. Um, the initial comment actually turned into an ongoing thread over on Plus Poro, which I actually found quite interesting. Now, the main problem when we talked about why people hate rolling moves is we found that it was a lack of player agency. It was a lack of uh, meaningful decisions. Now, Isaac doesn't see that as a problem at all. Rather, his issue with rolling moves is the downtime created by them. That is a very different perspective than what we took on when we were talking about it. And I would say very valid, like to add to our topic uh, from a few weeks back, that it seems like there are actually two main things to make people hate roll and moves, both the lack of interesting decisions and downtimes. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we're going to be answering questions from our lobbyists, the fine folk who have joined us here live on Twitch. So things have been interesting here the last couple of weeks. So a week ago, I got my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, and that had me feeling not so hot by the afternoon. So we had decided to cancel last week's show. So sorry if you came here looking for us or you were watching your podcatcher for us. Along with that, Amazon had a huge buy two, get one free sale and a coupon sale that both launched at once. Now, that was a week before Prime Day. And while well, Prime Day just hit Monday, Tuesday this week, yesterday at this point, which is honestly the busiest day of the year for Deanna and I. Now, these things combined meant there was no time for podcasts, YouTubes, blog things, or putting out general tabletop bellhop combat. Content combat? Tabletop Bellhop Combat, that's a, that's a different one. So basically, we went a week without creating any content uh, besides Amazon sale links and landing pages. It also meant I didn't really have any time to write up show notes or really prep for tonight's show until early this morning. So we're taking the easy way out. We decided we, we no longer do these once a month. We do them when we need to, and now we need to. So we are going to be doing a live Q&A or AMA tonight. So start sending those questions in, if you haven't already, via Twitter or Discord earlier in the day. Now, in order to give people in the chat room a chance to reply to that and ask some questions, I do want to take a moment to thank everyone who checked out our Prime Day page or followed us on social media or went over to the blog or whatever and, and interacted with our content whether that was purchasing things or just taking a look. It was a record-setting year for us in many ways. Uh, the amount of content we were putting out there, the amount of interactions, paid views, blog visits, click-throughs, and while most importantly, sales. Over the two days of Prime, we ended up selling over 2,000 items, which is a real big deal for us. While we love our Patreon patrons and the people who sub to us on Twitch and our subscribers and followers on YouTube, which are all important to us, currently... Affiliate sales is the thing that lets us keep playing and talking about games. Now, while we're working to shift that to something a little more stable, like if Amazon suddenly said, no, nope, no more affiliates, we'd be stuck. Days like Prime Day do help us to not have to scramble month to month and give us a nice, I don't know, nest egg is not the real word for, for it because we're not saving for later, but, you know, helps keep us solvent and not worried about running out of money by the end of the month. All right, well, well, uh, <clears throat> We uh, have people coming in, coming up with their questions in the lobby. We got a question from one of our patrons in the Discord earlier today. Courtney asks, who is your all-time favorite designer and which of their games is your favorite? All right, you want to start with that while I um, 
try to find what's going on with the captioning. It's fine. It's working. Oh, okay. Danielle was saying they're stuck. Oh, weird. <laughs> I can't even find the stupid window. <laughs> I don't, I don't know where my web caps near window went. It's buried under stuff. Most camera shifted. Yeah, you did. Now you can see me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that. That is weird. I... Do you move your camera or something? Possibly. Hold on. Let me, I can hear. There you go. You're now you're back. I don't know what happened there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We're good to go. All right, question, favorite designer. Uh, I think everyone who's listened longer, Courtney's a newer fan of the show. I know he went through the backlog. Jeez, uh, bless him. Um, <laughs> went through the backlog, but I would have to say Steffenfeld is definitely my favorite uh, board game designer. And favorite game is, whew, I, you know what? I want to say Amerigo, because it was my favorite Feld for a very long time when I like played them a little more often, but... Due to the pandemic, we really haven't been playing a lot of those style of games because most Felds are not great to player. And like, it's been so long since I played Amerigo. I I can I don't even know if I remember how to play it. It uses a cube tower for action selection. I know you're exploring islands, but like like that's all I remember about it. Whereas more recently, I've been playing um, Carpe Diem, which I really enjoy from Feld and Bruges. Though trying to teach Deanna and Sean playing online didn't turn out too good, <laughs> so so Bruges somewhat that that there we have to add Bruges to the Sean playlist. Now that we've knocked some games off on the list, we need to rebuild it. We need to add Bruges to the Sean playlist. Um, I know Deanna loves Trajan. One of my favorites of all time is Macau, which is very out of print. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to go with Amerigo just because the last time someone asked me that and I actually sat down and looked at all my Feld games now extrapolating that I've now played Merlin and I've now played, um, like I said, Carpe Diem and a few other newer Felds Luna I've played since then. I still think Amerigo's better, but it's been so long since I played it. I need to confirm that. Maybe I'd sit down and like be, this is too epic. There's too many choices. There's too much going on, but I, I'm going to go with Feld and Amerigo. So right now, I will say most excited, right? If You know how we do the, the the top 50 games of right now? If you ask me what Feld do you want to play right now, if Sean was here, I'd say Bruges. If it was just Deanna and other people who I play with all the time, I would say Carpe Diem. Like, those are the ones I'd be most interested in playing right now. Because Amerigo, I'd have to I'd have to prep. I'd have to, I'd have to be like, no, we can't play it because it's got a thick rule book. It's well done. It's, it's color-coded and stuff like that. It's by Queen Games. They do a great job at color-coding their rule books and stuff. <clears throat> and then Deanna saying, I, I love Trajan, but I hate teaching it because, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on. It's one of those games where there's so many options in the game, kind of like when we taught Eclipse. Uh, there's You have to front load everything. Like you need to know all the possible options before you take your first move. And it's such a pain to teach that way. And like, I wish I could teach Eclipse by having like setting Sean up and going, go, what do you want to do? Well, I want to move my ships. Okay, that's how you do it. But it just, it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Like it, it wouldn't work that way. And I think if I, if I realized we were playing that, I should have watched a, a, a video for that's that. That's fine. I, I don't to one think on the, the teach down. was that bad. No, it really wasn't. I mean, we, again, we had, we had more time as people will learn later. Yes. So uh, I see lots of questions yeah. rolling in from the Absolutely. chat. So I think we're probably going to ignore the ones we got in our discord earlier in favor of those awesome people who joined us live. Now, do you have a favorite designer? Uh, you know, I know what? You don't track designers as much. Yeah, but I'm I, to think. I have to say, I, I really probably don't. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, no, I, I can't. I can't really yeah. nail anyone down as that, uh, unfortunately. I'm like, I don't know who designed the DC deck building game. I honestly don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, those are. It's a good question. Are, are they even <laughs> all the same designer? Probably not. I would I would be shocked if they were because there's such a, take a quick look. So there's such a difference of... between uh you know games like uh you know the, the core games and some of the expansions versus uh, versus the crisis uh versions or even the head to head versions. Matt Hyra and Ben Stoll. See no hmm. yeah, no, that's uh, those are not names that I'm overly familiar with. Yeah, I know no. I, I there are others I definitely enjoy like I, I'm tempted to say Prospero Hall, but that's not one designer. Yeah, again, but that's a design team. It's a, that's a design, design team, but they have done some really impressive stuff. They have. Uh, I mean, if I was going to go that, if 
you know, if if, if, we, if we wanted to cheat, I could say Prospero Hall and Horrified is probably uh, well, yeah. Oh, the there one. you go. So, I think Prospero Hall counts. Um, I'm a big fan of the Bamboozle Bamboozle Brothers as well, Sen and Chris. I haven't um, played it yet, so I'll well. <laughs> well, no, you yeah. you played, but wait, there's more. That's that. That's true. I have. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Th- that is them. Um, and well, the Scooby Doo is awesome. Sean has that now. Mm-hmm. We pass that on. All right, what's our next question? Okay, well, our next uh, question comes from lobbyist Pax the Paladin. Question from my daughter. After I shared your great big list of tabletop mechanics Ah. with them, how do you define a mechanic? I came up with a thought. It's any interaction between players and the game system. Could be a way the system affects players, a way players change the system conditions, or a way players affect each other. How would you define it? And I'm just going inter- to interject here before before Mo answers. Um, and there's actually a huge uh, online battle about this mechanic, mechanism. V- mechanic versus mechanics yep. or mechanism. Yes. Uh, technically, if you want to be all English uh, language uh, n- n- cruel or, or a stickler, uh, mechanic is a person who fixes things and fixes engines in particular. Uh, and mechanics or mechanism is the correct term for no, the games and we got we we, we were term. never we were we were never uh sticklers about this we we couldn't no. care less but there are a lot of people out there who will complain loudly if you use the term mechanic in this context mechanic came from video gaming the mechanics of the game and then branched into board gaming and languages change over time nowadays it's a game mechanic I know very few people that use mechanisms <laughs> and the ones that do um, tend to fit the term grunyard pretty well. <laughs> so, yes, um, honestly, it, 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 it's your user experience. Uh, um, a mechanic or a um, mechanic or a mechanism is the thing that lets you interact with the game. It, it's the moving parts. It's what makes the game do what it does. It's, it's the system of the game. It's what makes it a game instead of uh, a loose playtime activity the rules of the game are how to interact with the game mechanics so it's it's the moving parts it's what makes the game do its thing and i would say the rules actually are probably the ui for the mechanics that actually makes more sense this probably could have been a whole topic actually <laughs> we probably could have went on and debated back and forth on this one but i i would say it, it's it's the thing that does something in the game like like otherwise you just have a bunch of cubes on the board and you have some dice well i roll the dice well what do i do with that Rolling the dice isn't really a mechanic, but then if I use them to move a piece, oh, I have a roller move. If I use them to generate resources, you have a, a random resource generation system or whatever, right? Like, like like having cards in your hand versus tableau, those are two different things. Building a tableau means permanence, whereas cards in your hand tend to get played. And, and those are different mechanisms or mechanics. I should just not stick to mechanics. <laughs> Sorry, That's what I always use. I know. I, 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 I put it in your brain. Uh, so nah. interestingly, w- Wikipedia actually has a huge article on this and starts off by saying there are no concrete definitions. Um, there you go. But use, they use phrases like uh, the rules that govern and guide the player's actions. See, to um, me, that's the rules. Or, or a game's mechanics effectively specify how the game will work for the people who play it. Um, yeah, computing definitions include opinion that... Ga- Systems of interactions between the player and the game. See, that makes more sense to me. Because uh, the other thing, too, is is if there's anything behind the scenes. I was trying to think if there are any mechanics in board games that happen on their own, and I can't think of any in board games. Like in, in video games, yes. It's all kinds of stuff you never see. Well, but I mean, there, there, there are AI. In a board game, well, I mean, there's the AI, like, you know. Uh, no, but the actual mechanic would be like flip a card to find out what happens. Yeah. Where like there's nothing where because I did this this and this this happens, I I can't think of anything like that though maybe. Uh, I mean some resource generation I guess happens. Yeah, that way in some. I don't games. know, but then you'd have like whatever like a, like a market adjustment mechanic, which would then take yeah. your resource generation and adjust it. So I, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's what makes the game work, right? It's 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 the bits, it's the the mechanisms. I guess that that's where that term would fit better. The, the 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 bits the engine the right. the the stuff that makes the game work i mean arguably the dice tower 
in some of your favorite games, or the cube towers in some of cube your favorite towers. games are behind the scenes uh, mechanisms yeah. that you don't uh, have anything to do with, right? You, you, it's it's a black box See, that you yeah, input but is, in is and the, put out. Is the cube tower a mechanic? I don't think it is. I think the mechanic is you drop cubes in a tower and then you read the output. But but something has to generate. I mean, if if it was just that, then whatever you dropped in would come out. There has to be a hidden mechanic in there. Yeah, yeah. I just don't know if that's a mechanic or a tool. To me, that's more of a tool. Where the mechanic is, you take all your armies, you gather them together, and you drop them in the tower, and then you read the results. To me, that's the mechanic. What happens in that tower is like a tool. That's that's you don't well, again, influence that. But again, it's, again, it's, you're not interacting with that. What's happening inside? But again, though, that that's why it's the hidden mechanic, right? It's so yeah. it's it's like. You know, when you swing a sword in a video game, you think you're swinging the sword and you're hitting and something's happening. But the game is doing a whole bunch of maths that you don't, that doesn't affect that you don't know about. But it's still happening there in the background to decide what happens when the sword hits the bad guy. Yeah, I guess. So that's the that's the hidden mechanic aspect. There aren't too many like that, though. I think it's the only one I can think of. Yeah, there are um, a lot. There are. Yeah. I mean, you could argue um, the how the marbles come out in gizmos um, yeah that's what i was i was trying to think like gizmos <laughs> potion explosion like there's a there's a few yeah but there I there are I, too many I, yeah uh, I, I, I still don't know if i'd call those hidden things as as part of the uh, a mechanic again like potion explosion mechanic is i take a marble and then if matching colors come out i take those two right and then stuff happens but that's not the mechanic yeah and, and tool is the range the mechanic the, the is what according to NC, the and and see argue i would argue it's not an rng it's a prng because there is no real randomness involved there uh in, uh, in especially not in the cube tower um it's not what i'm thinking is, is using the term that the mechanic is how the players interface with it you don't interface with the inside of the tower you don't right. interface with the machine and potion explosion no, no, you don't interface and that's with, that's with why that's why i'm specifying hidden hidden mechanic right it's yeah it, it just, is the, something that acts a hidden mechanism game. Here we Maybe go. that's where the, <laughs> the terms come in. We have the stuff that makes the games work. Yeah. And the, 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 a bunch of separate pieces that interact together in a way that it produces a game. Right. And it, it, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so many different things. Again, it's, you know, you can have a player and there are two players and two dice, but that could be any number of, an, of, of mechanics. Anything, I mean, right? there's a yeah, lot yeah. of different mechanics that could be in play there with just two people and two dice. Yes. Um, so it, it, it's all about the, the rules and, and implementations of the systems. Yeah, it could be a dexterity game where you're stacking the dice on top of each other and then the next person has to take the die from the bottom and <laughs> whoever drops the dice first loses, right? Like go. Just because you have two dice doesn't even necessarily mean you have to roll them. Yep. Uh, or you could roll All them right. and build the build based on how you roll them, which yes, is... you could you could roll one and then you got a, a six, so you have to use six fingers to move. <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're gonna we're gonna invent a bunch of games. We'll make make an itch.io mm -hmm. uh, account and start making games to be played with two people and two dice. Yep, there we go. You could have the 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 you know you roll a die to figure out which body part you have to touch together with the die in between, and then make it to the end of the room and back without dropping them. There we go. <laughs> uh all right uh next up we've got a question from major kayla in the chat room any board game kickstarters catching your eye right now i i would have to go to board game kickstarter <laughs> I'll, I'll be i'll admit like for for a content creator i'm bad this way i I'm, I'm failing take my card away here you go um i don't tend to track kickstarters anymore i, I don't watch them I, if they show up in my social media feed i might get interested and click through um, I would say I hear about them on podcasts, but I'm finally up to August of 2020. So that's not my excuse anymore. So between not being caught up on podcasts and never actually just going to Kickstarter and browsing anymore, I honestly don't even know what's hot right now. So I have like to I, say for me, I do actually uh, yeah. hit Kickstarter, but it has not been, and we were actually having a discussion about this before the show, it has not been very good about showing me content that I might actually <laughs> yes. buy or might actually want. Um, so while I do have some board games, uh, that are already funded and I'm waiting for, uh, I have not seen anything all that interesting that's, that's coming down the line. Nothing has really stepped out at me. I haven't seen anything in the address. There's a bunch of stuff out there, but none of it is really kind of yeah. leaping at me saying you must buy this. 
But what I've seen, Valor and Villainy, again, the only reason I know anything about that game is it was a Prime Day deal on the older version. And I saw people complaining the old version didn't have solo, so they're backing the new one for the solo. But that's literally all I know about the game. I know <laughs> nothing else. Uh, there's an Isle of Cats expansion with kittens that you can get the base game. But I, I don't know. In most cases anymore, like I run tabletop gaming deals, right? I don't like paying full price for <laughs> games. And in most cases, these Kickstarters, they're like reprinting of a game that's already available in stores, maybe with an expansion, don't tend to have enough exclusives to be interesting to me. Yeah. Um, one I saw I couldn't believe exists is AEG is doing another big game night box. And it's on Kickstarter, so maybe it'll work this time. But this was an experiment AEG did, which we're going to be talking about an AEG game later in the show tonight. Um, they put up this thing called called the Big... Or, no, it wasn't Big Black Box. It was just like Black Box or something like that. Black Box Party Night. No, Black Friday. That's what it was. The AEG Black Friday Black Box. And it was a box you were supposed to buy on Black Friday. And you would then get it home and get games you didn't know what was in it. it was supposed to be like a surprise pack. And what it was, was all actually printed AEG games, but rethemed. So you, even if you own the game before, at least you're getting a retheme. And no, it, it did okay. The first one that came out, the big deal was it came with a full, complete copy of Trains, the deck building game that's very much like Dominion, but with Trains and a board where you can do some route control. We just talked about Trains actually on our um, Next Step Games from Ticket to Ride episode. That was in there. And then a whole bunch of other games. There was a version of, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It was a really neat retheme. It was a it was a Deadlands retheme of this game, Seven Heroes or something like that. I'm totally drawing a blank on the name of this, and I'm not looking it up ahead of time. <laughs> trying not to cheat. Whenever we do these AMAs, I try to just work off the top of my head and then maybe check facts after. But anyway, a Seventh Hero. That's what it was. It was a retheme of Seventh Hero, but Deadlands, so it had that weird West feel. That was really cool. And there was like six other games, and also there was some version of Love Letter in there. There was something I think called Bacon Wars, and it's like it was okay, but like. I put that on my shelf and it's just a big bo black box and I forget what games are in there. <laughs> so I never play them and it's just, it wasn't that cool. So then they're like, oh, the first one was a success. And I think mainly because the day it came out within two hours, someone on Board Game Geek said, oh my God, it's cheaper than buying trains, buy this instead. So it did pretty well. Then they put out a second one. It was the red box, again, for Black Friday. This one was eight new games, including supposedly, I think it was one or two never before published games. So not only would you get re-themes of existing popular games, you would get two new games. I bought that and I actually broke it out on New Year's Eve with people over gaming thinking, we're going to try all these awesome new games and it just flopped. The games weren't that good. There was a meta game where everyone at your game party night was supposed to get a roll. And then by the end of the game, it kind of like the old um, uh, assassin or murder game but it was more happy themed and none of the games in there were really great. Like they were all okay. And that one flopped. Like if I remember correctly, at least before they moved, CD realm still had two copies. Mm -hmm. And this is from like 2015 or something like that. <laughs> like they just couldn't move it. And then they're like, we're going to do this new thing and put out these boxes and call it game night box. And again, it's, they're not going to tell you what's in it. And you're just supposed to show up to a game night. Like, Hey, let's get 12 of your friends together and have a game night. And then we're going to open this up and there's our games to play. And it flopped. Well, they're doing a new one, but they're kickstarting it and they're being obvious about what games are in it, I think. But I was just like, didn't that fail completely? <laughs> I'm trying to see what, what they're calling it now. Here yeah. it is. Big game night. No, that's not it. It's an interesting concept. That's for sure. I'm trying to find it on. It's big game night, Prevere convention experience nine days ago. So. Big Game Night, AEG's premier convention experience, can't make it to game night. Yeah, host your own board game night with two brand new AEG games and a special bonus, limited to 2,000 backers. But they're at least telling you what the two games are. So this is like a host your own game night, you're going to get two games and a surprise game. Like, I don't know, someone at AEG just thinks this is such a great idea. <laughs> and to be honest, it's at $44,000. So this seems to be working for them much better than the retail versions. So yeah, AEG big game night. But yeah, I, I, I just thought it was so weird. So uh, Mage Gilda just shared in the chat room, uh, Skeptics board game, a game with paranormal investigation by Jonathan Uziak in Buffalo. Oh, that's cool. Which I was is, say uh, yeah, which is, uh, which is funded with 14 days to go. So uh, um, there's a new Power Rangers expansion. That's a big one. If you got the first game, Power Rangers, uh, whatever, Defenders of the Grid or whatever. I didn't get into that originally right um from renegade games so that that's a big deal 
Um, I keep seeing multiple companies putting out round dice. I don't know what's the deal with that. Um, Heroes of Barcadia, I keep showing off my feed, which fits because you like your character sheet has as you fill it up with beer. And as you drink, your stats change. <laughs> like somehow, I don't know. It looks interesting. That's uh, that, that it's your book. hit points. There you go. Your drink is your hit points. Uh, okay. So you have like five hit points, 40 hit points, 30, 10. That, so, but I can't stand the artwork on it. So that, I wouldn't That buy board it game that book reason. I reviewed uh, a few weeks back uh, is on there and funded. Oh, it funded. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. More power to them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, I, don't, I don't see much else. Like again, I don't know what Kitcher's showing me. Yeah, I just, again. Eh. I I just again I don't I stopped. I stopped paying attention to Kickstarter basically. And there's always RPG stuff. I, I literally yeah. have stopped with the, the shutdown and out lockdown. I gave up on buying or looking at anything role playing. I, I have a backlog of stuff to try, including a whole bunch of stuff we reviewed early last year, like Alien and Tales from the Loop. I, we started working with Free League, which was awesome, but I didn't get any of the games to the table because they're all not like two player games and they're not games I'm going to play with my kids because more mature themes. My kids are not going to like Alien and Tales from the Loop can get a little weird and spooky. And I don't, I don't know. We have magical kitties to play with them. Yeah, I, I, I just bought a role-playing game before we started <laughs> so there you go sean's buying them and reading them all but yeah i'm, yeah. I'm holding off uh this so. one I'm, I'm actually interested in this one this is uh the era system uh okay. there's a whole bunch of different era games and uh i i this is one that i wished i had found on kickstarter but found afterwards but it's uh era the important the empowered is the superhero version of the era system so yeah i've heard of era but i know nothing about it at all yeah there's so, Ryan. I was wondering. Sean was like going on about coffee for a good twenty minutes earlier. I know we didn't it would work. him. But uh, okay, so uh, so Kickstarter is not too much catching our eye, but it is interesting that uh, that that skeptics game has relaunched and uh, seems to be doing pretty well. Like Battle of Gods up there for anyone who checked out our review. It's what about a quarter funded at this point? Yeah. Uh, next up, we have a question from Tech in the chat room. What game that you don't already own are you most looking forward to picking up? I don't know. I'm, I'm not <laughs> hyped about anything, honestly. I don't know. I, like, I hit this point sometime in the last, the, maybe it's just the pandemic, but the, the last little while, I'm like, I'm good. I got, I got plenty of stuff to play. I, I got piles. I got, I got 108 games in my pile of shame. Every now and then something will come out and I'm like, oh, that looks really cool. But like, there's nothing I'm going to be rushing out to buy anytime soon. Um, I do have three boxes over here. We're going to open up at the end of the show that should have new games in them to play. So it's not like I'm out of stuff to play. Um, no, honestly, I, I'm trying to think. I'm like, I want Hero Quest to show up. I don't know when that's due. Is that next year? Or is, I thought it was by Christmas this uh, year. Maybe, but we'll see. It's, you know. Girl still... quest, but I don't I'm not even all that hyped about that. Like it'll be cool when it shows up and I'll probably introduce the girls to it. I'm actually I'm uh think. I think the one thing I mean I'd be interested in getting my hands on is the up or the expansion for builders and bi my Minecraft builders and biomes. Uh I didn't the, even know there was one. The farmer's market expansion. Yeah, you, uh, you shared a link to that. And I'm also kind of interested in seeing the uh what potions brings to the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle when you get to that. Yeah, I don't know if we're even going to touch that box. We may just put that one aside and possibly uh, auction it or get rid of it. Mm. I don't I don't know if I any longer feel comfortable reviewing anything Harry Potter. Uh, fair. I, I, uh, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Like, no, yeah, that's... my kids love it. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I, I highly doubt that um, the reasons for doing that are going to go away. So Okay, because I know we, we kind of tried to avoid yeah, I know. the politics we talked at one about point, it. but... We talked about it before. I, we are no longer sharing deals on Harry Potter games. Oh, okay. So we might extend that to right. to a bit more. Because that's encouraging people to buy. And nope. well, that money yep. goes somewhere. No, absolutely. As for the stuff we already own, I haven't decided. But there's a chance we may not. Because basically, we're encouraging people to buy. So Fair. Fair. And here come all the thumbs down on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. If this even goes on YouTube. But um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. We'll probably play it with the girls. So, uh, know what I want after playing Eclipse? I want Twilight Imperium Four and the expansion because <laughs> I have learned that the expansion adds the fourth X. Because that is the thing. I, I, I'm like, it's Twilight Imperium. 
how do you release Twilight Imperium with no exploration? To me, that was just wrong. I, I was very disappointed with my one play of Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. It felt very incomplete. And sure enough, within a year, here's your big box expansion that costs almost as much as the base game that completes the dang game. Fancy Flight, just sell them together, or at least offer me a package now that both are out. So yeah, I would like to get it just to compare to Eclipse, which we just played, and plan some epic game nights, maybe get it to the table a little more often than the old one. Um, that's one. The Quacks of Quedlinburg expansion, as we've been playing Quacks more, I hear the expansion makes it way better, so I want that. Um, someone, Gene Chu, I think, was getting me excited about the Commander expansion for Space Base. Right, so, that's the second expansion. Yeah, it's yeah. the second expansion, which, yes, we have to get through the first one. <laughs> but one of the things it does is it ups it to seven players, which I'm like, one of my complaints about Space Base is it gets a little slow with more players, but it added in some fast-forward stuff to build up the beginning of the game, which I don't know exactly what that does. I, I, and then it, my, my problem, and again, we, yeah, we're going to okay, talk, we're, we're talk about it later, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's the market, seeing the market with seven players. <laughs> well, yeah. what... You have well, to have it's the not right the market, it's just how much table space. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, but, you know. The market doesn't change. It's no, the, the market doesn't the change, course. but you, you're going to be so yes. far away from the market, you're going to have to get up and go see it. Uh, now, I don't often do this, and this is something that uh, that I know Mo and D don't normally do, but Go Cuckoo is available on Amazon for under $10. Yeah, and, and it has been for a while. There's a link there in the chat room <laughs> if you want to go grab it. Because I'm yep. sorry, but Go Cuckoo is fantastic. We it cannot is. say enough good things about that game. There you go. There's an ad in the chat room. It's an ad. But if you don't have it yet, you should buy it. All right. So Ryan has pointed out that it was three years between the base game and the expansion. It felt like it was one after another. And <laughs> I'm not saying it makes player extermination. It's exploration. Unless I, I must have enunciated poorly. The exploration. There is no exploration in the base game. Everything, it's all face up and you know what's on every planet and you know what's there and you don't get to flip anything over. Whereas Prophecy of Kings has you put the sector tiles down face down and I think there's some other aspects of revealing the universe. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> That's what I missed. I'm like, for it, I love exploration. That's my favorite part of those. Zaya, I'm the guy who wants to go collect all the exploration tokens and flip the new tiles until we build the whole world. That's that's right. what I enjoy in those games. And then I want to tend to want to play like pick up and deliver, which is something you can't do in TI or Eclipse. There's there's, there's no just be a space trader right. mechanic in those games, which is why they're not sandboxes. Well, your empire. I mean, you're you're running an empire. You're not running. Yeah, you know, it's a not a. Ships. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, there aren't too many empires that just decide, oh, you know what? All we're going to do yeah. is trade. <laughs> I, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, the, the new Steffenfeld games are coming from Queen. There's four coming pretty soon. I am looking forward to see what they do with those. So these are our new games that are the old game mechanics reused in new ways, um, basically due to licensing issues. So like there's a new version of Bruges coming. There's a new version of uh, uh, Macau and all the others. But I, I'm on the fence on these because I own the originals. And unless he significantly improved them, do I really need the new version? And and, I, and Feld can make his games too fiddly. It's happened before. And I worry they're going to lose some of it in translation. Like Bruges won't be the same once it's not Bruges. So those are coming from Queen Games. I don't actually know when. Again, I haven't, I, I'm not on the pulse on some <laughs> of this stuff anymore because I don't yep. care. We, we talk about the games we're playing and enjoying and what we love. Yep. Never really been about the new hotness, but even more so. You would think with all the free time we have now that I'd be more <laughs> up on board game news. So many new games just look like a bunch of pretty miniatures too. Like I'm not saying they're bad, yep. but just like my Facebook feed and all the Kickstarters and all the games people seem to be pushing. I'm just like, ah, another game with some pretty mini. Yeah, I, I'd, much, some pretty miniatures. I'd much rather people advertise something about the game Rather yeah, the than mechanics. just the pretty miniatures, because I'm not mm. gonna buy. I will not buy a game that has pretty miniatures unless you've proven to me that there's a game there. Because yeah. miniatures are a pain in the butt to salt to store, and I don't paint mm -hmm. things, and it, it's more hassle than it's worth. I'd rather you know, I'd rather not play something with pretty miniatures unless yep. it's really, really worth it. I know there was stuff I was excited about a year ago I never got into, and it, it just I, there's so much out there anymore too. Yep. No, I mean, I'm, give, give, if I had gotten this question ahead of time, I am sure I probably could have found a few. But yeah, the new, the new Felds, I, I, I do think it's time to get a copy of Twilight Imperium. Maybe I need to take the plunge and figure out who to talk to at Asmodee or something. And I, you know, I mean, I've got, 
I've, I've got, you know, the Minecraft expansion, uh, potential. I'm interested in seeing what's in the expansion that shall not be mentioned. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, I've got some Kickstarter stuff that I'm, I'm waiting on a couple of games that I'm waiting on that I'm interested in rap gods and hoop gods, mm -hmm. uh, and, and interesting to see how those play. I don't know anything new coming from Prospero Hall. Oh, Goonies. There's one. I want to see the Goonies game. Ah, uh, yes. That, that's one I would like to check out. Though I don't even know if that's out yet. I think it is. I think it's on Target. I think it's a Target exclusive right uh, now. Maybe. Which will last a month or three or whatever, and then you'll be able to get it everywhere anyway. Yeah, Pan won't... Am. That's another one. That's supposed to be really good. That's another Prospero Hall. Pan Am is supposed to be really good. Though I just watched um, The Aviator. And now I can't help but think of Pan Am as an evil empire and terrible. Like, I don't know if anyone's seen that. It's a Martin Scorsese starring, um, oh, the Titanic guy. I can't remember his name off the yeah, top yeah, of my head. I know who you mean. I'm not horrible <laughs> with names, but I know exactly what you mean. And and it's it's actually a really solid movie about, not Brad Pitt. <laughs> no, Brad no, Pitt no, was no. not in Titanic. No. Uh, he's famous for lots of Leonardo. other stuff. Leonardo. Leonardo DiCaprio. That's yeah, it. Yeah, Leo. That's it. But yeah, The Aviator is good. It's on Netflix. It's worth watching. It stands up. It's period piece about the birth of uh, air flight and commercial airports. All right. Uh, but anyway, it may be that if you watch that, you're just gonna be like, no, Pan Am's evil. Because, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what the whole movie's about is, is Pan Am making nasty agreements with the government to push out all the competition. Yep. Yeah. Howard Hughes. I, I couldn't remember the character's name either. So it was good. All right. Another question? Absolutely. So we're, uh, we're doing too many in one show to promote, which is bad. But yeah, well, I oh think well. we're probably on our last one for this haul. I think I'm just looking Are at we? time. I don't it's know. Been that long? Well, we're about an hour in. So uh Ryan asks, is there a game that you've sold, traded, or given away that you've later repurchased again? Nope. Easy question. Next. <laughs> No, seriously, I, I'm pretty good at making sure I don't give away stuff that I shouldn't have. The, I can't think of anything that I already bought. Every now and then, like, there's lots of my old toys I wish I hadn't gotten rid of, but more, mainly because, well, two things. One, some are worth way more money now, and I sold them at a yard sale. But second, I have kids now. Like, yeah. I would have loved to have just, like, I had bought my kids Star Wars toys. I could have gave them a ton of Star Wars toys. But, yeah, game-wise, no, I, I, I don't know. Maybe Deanna can think of something, but... I can't even think of something I regret giving away that I'm like, oh, I should have kept that. Uh, yeah, no, and, and I don't really. I'm, you don't I'm, have a lot of games. I haven't gotten, to get rid, I haven't of. gotten rid, rid of games, really. So, uh, no. I don't know what that means. It means typo. Nope. Yeah, nope. <laughs> no. Like, I, sorry. I, I don't, well, for one, for years, I didn't get rid of games. Like, I honestly was that collector, and I was... My excuse was, well, I'm not just a player, I'm also a collector, and I want my game collection to look good, and it looks good to look at, and it looks pretty on my shelves, and it looks great. And I'm like, no, because then it got full, and I ended up with piles that didn't look good, and now I'm like, I'll start getting rid of stuff. But for years, I wouldn't. Like, I, it took me getting over a 1,000 games before I was willing to get rid of any. But right now, I have, I don't know, 40? Like, on this shelf beside me that I planned on getting rid of, but then the pandemic hit and we were going to be working with the local game store to start doing some consignment sales where they put my games there for sale and you can buy used games there, which is kind of cool because it makes you, um, makes the gaming more accessible, right? Like it, it opens it up to another um, income bracket really could be able to pay, play some of these great games. Right. Uh, and, and plus get me some money, which again, <laughs> we can always use a bit more. Ryan's mentioning he, yeah. he repurchased uh, Risk 2210 AD. So I never had that one. My cousin had that one and said it was the best version of Risk he ever played. Yeah, there are a couple I wouldn't mind picking up, to be honest, but we didn't get rid of the originals. I wouldn't mind a second copy of Seafall and restarting with some people who are more dedicated that aren't going to give up partway through. And a second copy of Risk Legacy to, to start over for the same reason. Well, we didn't give up, but like that particular group of four people haven't gotten together for three or four years now, let alone... right. The pandemic even, even it was pre long time yeah it was even pre-pandemic we weren't getting together to play that game so i would like to restart risk legacy perhaps with someone who hasn't played it as far as we have or with <laughs> someone who's finished it. i don't know i don't want someone who's finished it because we had a lot that wasn't unlocked but that's not really rebuying something we got rid of that's a legacy game we'd like to start with a new group right 
Though honestly, like if you gave me the choice, I think I'd rather just grab Aeon's End Legacy and start a new legacy game. There's one. I want Aeon's End Legacy and Clank Legacy. Those are two games I want that I haven't bothered picking up because I'm like, when am I going to play a legacy game? Yep. So yeah, Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated. This goes back to the other question. And and um, Aeon's End Legacy. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm interested in the Acquisitions Incorporated Clank, but uh, I don't think I would really end up doing a legacy with my kids. I don't think they'd really be all that I, I into it. Uh, I could be wrong. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> we have we have a hard time getting the whole family to sit down to play stuff. Like, my kids love games and they'll play them, but it's the timing overlap. Like, we tend to have time at the end of the night when they're in bed. So yeah. it just doesn't work that well. But yeah, I, I Clank Legacy, I think... It's definitely up there. And I know the acquisitions incorporated theme, take it or leave it. I just really like Clank, especially the fantasy Clank. Yeah, yeah. And oh. Aeon's End, that's, that should be on the list of games to play with Sean, but it's in my cell pile. Because <laughs> <laughs> I really, I want the newer edition. I have the original printing and the art's bad and the dials don't work. Like it, it was one of those games. It was an early Kickstarter success and it got made, which is awesome. Then it did really well. So then they're like, well, we're going to clean it up and make the game we should have made in the first place. And now I have like the old obsolete gruddy copy, which isn't really, but it's just, it's, it's in my head, I realize. Yeah, yeah. But they also like tweak the rules and rebalance cards. So like there is another reason. But again, I, I hate even buying copies of games I already own. So I'm like, is it enough different that I should buy it? Yeah. Oh, wait, I have an example. Oh. I have an example, but it's it's because I'm dumb. So I got rid of my copy of Anachrony with the exosuit commander box set and all the miniatures huge box i sold it on facebook marketplace i dropped it off in this new subdivision i didn't know existed to a couple who had just moved to windsor who were really excited for when things open up so they could start coming out to our game nights because they were asking why do you because i I'm, they're like do you have anything else for sale and i like literally went around with my camera and sent them like <laughs> pictures and they bought like seven games off me like why do you own so many games i'm like oh i run the windsor gaming resource and i do local events plus i just love games blah, blah blah like oh i can't wait to come out and then my kickstarter copy of the new printing of anachrony came and it ends up i did not buy the new printing of anachrony i bought the upgrade box which lets you upgrade your original copy which I just sold to someone like, I don't know, six weeks prior. Ouch. I thought I was getting the whole thing. And I'm like, what the heck? I swear I backed for the whole thing. And the box isn't big enough. And what's going on? And I went on Kickstarter and I started digging through. And I got to say, it's hard to tell on Kickstarter what you actually backed for when companies use stuff like backer kit on the back end. Oh, yeah. So it looks like I, ju I just backed the project but it doesn't tell me what I actually backed for. So I ended up having to go through my emails to find my backer kit email. And eventually I'm like, Oh crap. I didn't go all in. I didn't just replace everything. And here I was like, when I booked it, like when I, when I backed it, I actually went, now I need to sell my copy to recoup some of the cost of backing the new edition. Well, no, I didn't back the new edition. I just backed the upgrade kit. Ouch. So Thankfully, I emailed these people and I said, look, I know I just sold you an acrony the other day, but would you be willing to sell it back? And I explained the whole thing to them. They're like, actually, yes, because we didn't like it. Oh. And I'm like, oh, well, it's too bad you didn't like it. But the fact they're willing back, like the problem was I sold it to them in a bundle. So negotiating what price I paid to get it back was a little fuzzy, but right. I got it back. So yes, I bought a game I got rid of because I'm dumb. Because I thought I backed a Kickstarter for a shiny new edition, whereas I only backed for the upgrade kit. And I think I was confusing it with Eclipse, because Eclipse, I backed around this, both of those came out around the same time. And Eclipse, I did go all in. I, I got the complete upgrade with the extra box set and everything. Right. <laughs> yeah, we all we all make mistakes at times. Yeah. Yes. Hey, there's games I bought twice, too, like this one right here. This, we, we might do a giveaway on this one. <laughs> and I don't even know what happened. I bought this on Amazon because it was really cheap. And I think I just might just added it to cart twice. Because mm. when it showed up, there were two copies. And I'm like, I don't need two copies of this. <laughs> well, at least, yeah. Well, I, and then there's that, there's that one RPG I got when, where they, they printed it twice in, this, in the book. I got the book. And yeah. It's only one the book, books. but it's in there twice. I'm like, well, I can't, yeah, even, I can't even give that to someone else because it's in the book. It's, I'd have to, like, break the binding. and <laughs> Break the binding and sell two copies. Yeah. You bring it to your your book binding friends and get them to rebind <laughs> it for you. 
Yep. Alrighty. Yeah. So, do we have? Are we good, or we got one more? What do we want to do? Uh, we have nothing else from the lobby. So, I think we might as well move on. If it's a shorter than usual, it's shorter than usual. We're kind of burnt out here and could use some time <laughs> off. So, and we yep. have to get up early tomorrow for for a medical appointment too. Mm, right? Did you try your? And no, I haven't <laughs> done the bottom of the ninth giveaway. All right. Well, I think that wraps up. This unplanned live Q&A. Remember, if you've got a gaming or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to our look at Space Base, a dice-driven sci-fi engine builder from AEG. Here's where I would usually point out that we got a review copy of this game from the publisher, but that's not the case this time no that's right this one comes from my own personal game collection though i gotta say hey aeg if you're listening if you want to work with us in the future i'm cool with that indeed especially with all the great future content you're undoubtedly percolating <laughs> working with jay and sen in your design forum pitch project event now space space was designed by john d claire and features artwork from chris walton was published in North America by AEG, um, also known as Alderic Entertainment Group. First came out in 2018. Plays two to five players with games taking about an average of an hour. Though I got to say that's very dependent on player count and player experience and AP. So it can range. We have seen some longer games. Space Base has an MSRP of $39.99 US, but can often be found for less than that. And while it's tempting to think of this as a sci-fi version of Kingdoms of Valeria, you shouldn't. While there are some vague similarities, it really is its own game and should be judged on its own merits, and we'll get more into this later. Yeah, people also like to compare this one to Machi Koro, and to be honest, once we get to the end of the review, I am going to spend some time comparing those three games. Now, in Space Space, you are a Commodore in command of a small fleet of ships in a race to 40 victory points. Now, these ships begin docked at your space base. Each turn, the dice are rolled, and all players will generate resources in the form of credits, income, and victory points. The active player will then purchase either one ship or one colony. Newly purchased ship or colony will replace a ship that was docked with the replaced ship being deployed. Deployed ships generate resources on other players' turns. Due to this resource generation mechanism, Space Base keeps players engaged, watching, and counting on each roll of the dice. For a look at what you get in the box for Space Base, be sure to check out our Space Base unboxing on YouTube. Now, Space Base comes in a fairly small box that contains a surprisingly thick rulebook over a plastic box insert that holds the rest of the components and keeps them all nice and separate. Actually, a really solid insert. Now, the rules are a whopping 32 pages long. You don't expect that from a game in a box this small, but only 16 half of those are actual rules, which is still a lot for what's really not that complicated a game. Now, a large portion of the rulebook is for reference. And there's also a ton of fluff and background information, which is surprising to me for a game that at its core is really an abstract strategy game. Now, along with this book, you do get five very large and long player boards, two six-sided dice that feature a rocket on one side, on the one side, uh, 45 plastic cubes, and 204 cards. Now, there is a set of starting cards for each player, plus three different decks of market cards, marked one, two, three, a set of colony cards, and a start player cards. Now, all of these cards are a rather odd, unique size. Now, I didn't measure it, but they appear to be about half the width of a standard playing card, but I didn't actually like, put them on a playing card to see if they are half. Uh, overall, component quality is excellent. I Honestly, no complaints. Every, everything's decent. Nothing really wowed me, but nothing wrong at all. As Mo said, while the quality is great, the size of the cards, while important to be that size, mm. is weird and takes a beat to get used to. Yes. <laughs> well, now that we know what you get with a copy of Space Space, how does it play? So a game starts with each player taking one of those player boards and a set of starter cards. The player board has spots for 12 ships, and you're going to put one spot, one ship in each spot, and they're assigned one through 12. A central market is built using six face-up cards from each of the decks, with the decks placed there to refill the market as a game plays. Colony cards are also played face-up in numeric order. 
Players then take three color-coded resource cubes and mark their sorting resources on their board, which for every player starts at five credits, zero income, and zero points. So the market setup feels remarkably uh, familiar, actually, to Splendor, despite the fact that we talk about, you know, Valeria and, and, yes. and Machikoro in there. Now, to determine the start player, each player draws a random card from the one market deck. They pay for this card out of their starting credits and place it in the appropriate slot on their board, deploying the ship that was already there. Now, I said deploying a couple times, so I'm going to explain what that is because it's going to come up. Deploying a ship means taking the card off the player board, flipping it 180 degrees, not over, 180 degrees, so it's upside down, and sliding it under the top of the board so you can only see the, the red portion of it. Now, the player whose new ship that they just drew is in the highest slot from 1 to 12 becomes the start player with a roll of the dice breaking any tie. An actual game mechanic way of choosing start player and not some vague thing about which player last looked up into the stars <laughs> or some garbage. Yes, Sean is a stickler when it comes to start player rules. But this is a game where I did not go grab Schwazi, so good work on that AEG. Now, each turn of Space Base starts with the active player rolling the two six-sided dice. Then everyone, not just the active player, will activate ships based on the numbers rolled. Now, after each roll, players will look at their, their board, their ships, and decide if they want to use both dice separately, so each number separately, or the sum of the two dice. They're then going to activate the appropriate ships. The active player will activate their docked ships, whereas all the other players get to activate their deployed ships. This is where I actually made a mistake in the first round or two. It's not one of the dice or the two dice combined. It's two separate dice or yes. the two combined dice. Yeah, and I didn't notice you were making that mistake when we played, so I do apologize for that. Now, many of the ships, including all the 12 starter ships, generate one or more of the three resources, either currency, income, or points. Other ships feature all kinds of special actions, which I'm not going to get into here, but include things like letting you shift your dice to the right, which generally are better cards, allowing for re-rolls, getting to draft cards for free, and so on. Now, some of these abilities also require collecting charge cubes on the cards. Now, I don't think it's worth getting into the full details here, but I will say the charge cube mechanic is the most confusing part of the rules and a little fiddly and worth reading over a couple times or maybe sitting down to watch a video on how to play to make sure you've got it down before you start playing. Yeah, the cube-based actions are the one part of the iconography that is letting the game down to me. Mm -hmm. It makes sense once you know it, but it isn't easily instantly identifiable uh, yeah. Generally, otherwise, the iconography is very obvious as to what is what. Yeah, I'll get into uh, to a bit more on that when I get to my final thoughts later. But just for now, no, read over those rules a couple times before you play the first time. Now, after activating your ship or ships, you then get to purchase one card from the market. Now, we mentioned earlier the market's broken up into three areas divided by card cost, with the one cards being cheaper than the three cards. You pay the cost of the card, which you pay in credits, and you lose any leftover credits after the purchase is lost. Now, interestingly, your credit doesn't reset to zero, but down to your income level. So generating up your income level starts you with credits every round, which is could be really powerful. You're now going to place your new card onto your playboard and deploy that ship, which is that thing where you flip it and tuck it. Now, as you're reaching into the market or tucking a card, this is where the one major drawback to the game components in this game emerges the player boards and cube tracks it is almost mm -hmm. unthinkable that you won't at least once knock your cubes and need to think about where they should go back to and that's if you're lucky enough to only do it once yeah so far unfortunately the only upgrades for that are third-party uh, products on etsy yeah, this is one of those games where you don't want to put your board too close to the edge because you're going to catch it with a sleeve or something, and you don't want it too close to where everyone's reaching in. I got to admit, I would have loved some type of double-layered boards or some type of overlay. Um, we have been looking at purchasing one ourselves. So, yeah, that is, that is a definite downfall to this system. Now, instead of purchasing a ship on your turn, you also have the option to instead found a colony. Now, each game, there are 12 colonies in play. Every game, there are always 12 colonies. And each corresponds to a different spot on your player board. What these do is when you buy them, you get instant victory points. Just bang, points. But then they take up that spot. 
You can't purchase a ship with the same number. You can't replace it. And it also generates no resources on your turn, though that spot will still generate if you have any ships deployed, which you'd have to have at least one if you bought a colony. That's pretty much it. Play continues going around the table until one or more players reach 40 points. You then complete the existing round so all players have an equal number of turns and the players with the most points wins. So now that we know uh, what to play, what are your thoughts on this uh, sci-fi engine builder? So Space Base is one of those rare games that just feels right. I, like right from the moment you start playing it, from the moment you sit down and you draw that first card from the one deck and you dock it in your station and deploy the other one by flipping it around to the closing rounds of the game where everyone's scrambling to do what they can to squeeze in just a few more points and maybe get past that 40 mark. It just, the game overall just feels very tight and polished. Uh, until you run into your first cube action card <laughs> or your charge action, it just flows. Things are obvious. And the table will get into a rhythm, including even how you call out the dice mm -hmm. that are rolled to make it easier for everyone to decide on their activations and not slow down by trying to figure out what, oh, what did you want? No, you just, you roll the dice and you say, uh, two, three, five. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely, for me, that's something I carried over from Valeria. That's how I always read the dice out in Valeria. I read the individual numbers in the total. So you got three, three, six. Okay. And then everyone after a while doesn't even have to look at the dice. Now, some of the things I really love about this game that make it work, make it so good, um, is the fact you're always engaged, even on other players' turns. This isn't a game where you finish your turn and then you can lose focus, grab your phone, leave, whatever, space out. You want to know what numbers are being rolled every turn, hoping for just the right numbers to come up so that you score big or you're able to make a big move once the dice get back to you. Yeah, and one thing we did discover is that it is possible to have a runaway leader. Now, I can't say how much of that was suboptimal play on our side mm -hmm. versus excellent play with a touch of luck on D's side, but it was clear well before the game was over that we weren't going to defeat D. Yeah. Uh, now, more plays at a variety of player counts could help determine if, as I kind of expect, that was just a confluence of events that happened rather than an actual game balance problem. So I don't think it was. Plus, because of the way the game works, it, it still would have been possible for one of us to win. If we had rolled more 5, 6, 11s, D would have generated nothing every turn. If that just kept happening multiple turns in a row, now the odds of rolling 5, 6, or 11, and for anyone who knows it, knows that's not the highest possibility, but it is still possible. So, like, yes, you can have someone, if someone gets a good engine for generating points, it can be difficult to surpass that. Now, another thing I really like in this game, especially when compared to the other games that, uh, that are similar to this, is that you start with a full tableau. This is a huge difference from Valeria Card Kingdoms, where you start with only two cards in play and thus only have a small set of numbers that generate resources. In Space Base, when it's your turn, you always get something. You're going to get one thing or two things on either each individual die and the four the total. Then once you start deploying ships, if you're smart, you should be able to set it up. So you're going to get something on everyone else's turn as well. The key being, if you are smart, remembering yes. that it's not a pure bell curve because of the option to pick two separate dice or combined value is an important detail. Yeah, and that's my next thing I love about this game, actually, is the way the dice are used. This is, again, different from Valeria and Machi Koro. Most of these, uh, most of us gamers know 2D6 bell curve, right? Like some point we taught it, we learned it, we know that seven is the most common number rolled on 2D6. We, we either took it in school or someone told us that. But that's only true if you're adding the dice together. In Space Base, the number that will actually come up the most often is six. Due to the fact you can not only roll six on each of the dice, but there are a number of dice combinations that add to six, like one and five and four and two and so on and three and three. I like that change in probabilities. Along with this, I also like the way they balance the cards with ships in the higher numbers offering better rewards than ships in the lower numbers. This combines into a neat way especially with powers that let you swap your cards. There's a number of things that can go in where you can swap your, your 11 spot with your two spot. Well, your 11 card generally is huge because 11 doesn't come up as often as two. And being able to swap them can be really powerful. Yeah, while not vital, familiarity with the cards, at least in general and the different power sets that are available, will certainly help you make choices early in the game yeah. so that you can maximize later. And I think that was definitely one thing that I was missing 
early game was a better understanding of where I could go. And then that's mm -hmm. my fault because again, you do start with those three tiers out there. I should have spent more time looking at them. Well, yeah, and seeing planning ahead. Part of it too is it was a learning game for you. So I didn't want to flood you with all the possible card powers, whereas the one row was pretty simple, most of them. Yeah. And the other thing too is a lot of people don't realize how important it is to be able to shift your dice to the right, how, how powerful that can be, especially when you get multiple cards that let you shift multiple times. Now, my biggest complaint about Space Base is in regards to learning the game. Uh, for one, the rule book's a beast. Like, it, it's 32 pages. You don't need 32 pages for this game. Now, a large part of the book is stuff you don't need to know to play. Like, it just kind of, like, muddies it. Now, I think this might come from the fact that Aldrich is actually a company that launched by making D20 D&D &D RPG modules back in the day. That's what got their start. But there's like a ton of background information here, like all the different ship types and what role they play in the Navy and what's going on and what a Commodore is. And like none of this, like, like I get wanting theme in your game, but like none of that matters. Second is that whole charge cube system. Sean's mentioned it a few times here. Well, it's not like that complicated it's not like a heavy game it's not hard it's just not as intuitive as the rest of the game and what i find is that it breaks the flow like sean said you go around nice quick roll the dice get your stuff buy a card roll the dice put your stuff buy a card roll the dice buy your stuff get your card roll the dice buy a thing now get two extra things now swap two cards like it just it, it breaks that flow like that being able to draft multiple cards in a turn. There's one out there that lets you draft two cards and then purchase again, or getting to shop even more than once does it like get five extra credits and shop again. It just, it adds more AP and it messes up that flow. And then there's the added confusion that many of the charge cubes need different numbers of cubes, the charge cube based powers based on the number of players. And it's just something else. It's like a small little thing on the card that you got to kind of, you know, squint to look at and figure out and like, wait, how many players do we have this game? Like I know now, Two players, you use all the cubes everywhere. So that's stuck in my head, which I like. But once you're in three or four players, like, wait, does that have a three or four dots on it? It's just a little more fiddly than I would have liked with the rest of the game being so elegant. Yeah, I, I admit, I tended to avoid those charge ba uh, charge cube cards until la very late in the game, probably to the detriment of my play, simply because I just didn't want another thing to learn as I was playing. Yeah, which is totally fair. Like, I almost wonder if you could thin out the deck the first play and just take them all out, if that would, would work, like if there'd still be enough. Now, the other issue Space Base suffers from is how much space it takes up. This is due to the fact the player boards have to be able to hold 12 cards each with some room in between, like some wiggle room, and the resource tracker is going all the way from 1 to 40. Now, this is the reason you have half size cards. So we are kind of complaining about the card size, but now it makes sense because I can only imagine how big those player boards would be if they had full size cards. So I get it. But even with the tiny cards, this game takes up a lot of room. Now, we ran into an added issue due to the long boards is that using a non square table, uh, it's pretty much impossible to fit four or five players in a position where they can all see and reach the market in order to play space space on a larger size rectangular gaming table, which happens to be what I have in my game room. Yeah, in addition to uh, a layered cube track on your player board, a, a some other uh, way of displaying the market, maybe a vertical card system on a Lazy Susan would help. Uh, but uh, without uh, some sort of upgrades, it's certainly tough to manage at any player count above three or four without, a, you know, a table that's going to get people close enough without bumping into right. each other and able to see and reach that market in the middle. Like, I personally think it's probably perfect for playing at a poker table right your usual hexagonal table or even the kind of round blackjack tables probably work great my big eight by four boardroom table it just doesn't work we actually when playing four players play at our kitchen table because it's actually a little bit more accessible squeezing in a fifth player though would be difficult now speaking of numbers of players the other issue some groups may have with this game is how different the game plays at different player counts like i'll admit that it feels like, almost like you're playing a different game at two players as it does with four. The number of players to act between your turns greatly impacts the power of your deployed ships and the number of credits you're going to generate passively between turns. Like it just changes the scale. So when there's more players, when it gets to your turn, you're buying bigger cards, which changes the whole feel of the game. Now, personally, so far, I have enjoyed the game most with three players. But 
I liked it at every player count. I wouldn't turn down a game at any other player count. It's not like I'll only play this at three or it's terrible at two. I just have to say that some people may not enjoy it at different player counts. And I think you're going to have a swing. You're going to have people who love it at two and you're going to have people who love it with as many players as possible. Yeah, it's you can potentially generate a lot more income for every additional player added, which really ratchets things up that much more quickly. And I am going to address one other thing. I have to thank Red Meeple Ryan in our chat room for this is due to the heavy use of symbols that are not described in the PDF rule book. It's not accessible enough for a blind player to learn the game from the rules to be able to teach it to other players. So that is something, hey, G, if you're listening to, you may want to put a better icon reference somewhere in your rule book. Instead, what they do is they show pictures of cards and then a full description of what that card does. And that is a majority of that rule book. So there is there is an issue definitely there for people with vision impairment. Right. Now, overall, I've been really enjoying Space Base. Uh, my entire family digs it. Um, one of the kids not as much as the other one, but everyone I've taught the game to, which I'll admit it's COVID, it hasn't been a lot of people, but they've all really enjoyed it. There's still a lot of buzz out there for this game. And I got to admit, you almost never hear anything negative about this game. And I think that's for a good reason. This is a very tight and polished game. While the use of charge cubes could be a bit fiddly, the game overall is just very elegant and flows well. Since getting Space Base for my birthday this year, it has become one of my favorite board games of all time. When we redo our top 25 games, top 50 games, it'll be interesting to see exactly where it falls, but it's definitely up there. If you dig dice-driven engine builders, you probably already own Space Base. But if not, go out and pick this up. If you dig sci-fi themed games, despite really being an abstract engine builder, I think there's enough theme here for you to enjoy Space Base. Now, if you do prefer perfect information games with low randomness, this one may not be there for you. This is a dice-driven game with a market that's going to shift a lot in between turns. But I do recommend giving it a shot. This might be the one dice-based game that wins you over. Now, normally we would stop our review here, but because so many people want to lump Space Base in with Valeria Card Kingdoms and Machi Koro, how about a comparison between those three games? All right, so due to the fact Space Base, Machi Koro, and Valeria all use a very similar system of rolling D6 dice, using the results to compare to a tableau to generate stuff, both on your turn and your opponent's turn, people can't help but compare them. The thing is, I don't find these games all that similar. While they do share a similar core mechanic, the actual feel of each game at the table is very unique. And I'm not just talking about themes, like, yeah, one's fantasy and one's modern building cities and SimCity and what, no, that's not what I'm talking about. That does have some impact, but it's just the feel of the mechanics, how they interact, and the amount of player interaction is very different in these three role for resource based games. Honestly, starting right from the core mechanic, even that dice mechanic is actually different and changes the feel. In Valeria, you get to use the rolls on each D6 and the total. Whereas Space Base, you have to pick, do I use the two D6s or the total? And then Machi Koro, you choose how many dice to roll and you have to use the total. You don't get to use individual dice. That alone totally changes the probability curves in all three games. And that's a big part of what makes each game feel unique. Yeah, just like we were saying uh, earlier in the show, just because you're rolling two dice in two different games does not mean the probabilities are set in stone. And it's clear the designers took the specific maths in space space mm-hmm. into accounts in a number of ways in their design. Now, of the three games, Machi Koro is the most stab you in the back, competitive, in your face game with a large amount of take that element. Like the entire set of purple cards in Machi Koro are designed to penalize your opponents. And we also found at Machi Koro that money is just flying everywhere. It's bouncing back. You earn a bunch on your turn, then someone steals a bunch of it, then I buy a card, I save up all this money to buy something, and then someone steals half my money and so on. It's just flying everywhere. It's more chaotic. Now, Valeria also includes take that elements, though it does depend on which heroes you use. You can remove all the take that cards, or you can play with all take that cards. There are a number of cards that let you steal cards and resources from other players. Now, compared to both of those, Space Base is downright friendly. 
It's it's honestly mostly multiplayer solitaire, except for the fact you're probably going to want to hate draft, and there can be some competition over the colony cards. Now, there is one take that card included in the core game, and it's interesting because the use of that card is hotly debated online, with many groups removing it from the game just because it feels it doesn't fit, which I totally understand. In our game, more hate drafting probably actually yeah. would have helped us out, but it certainly didn't feel antagonistic. No. More like, you know, three empires all working to fill up the universe, and one was just going to be more successful at doing that. And that's another change between the two. Well, no, Machi Core is the same. It's, it's definitely a race. It's a race to those 40 points. It, it's not a, a um, beat up your neighbors or try to win the empire kind of game. Now, thematically, I did say that while the themes don't separate the games that much, they do matter. Space Base to me is, is, is somewhat thematic. It's kind of in the middle. Machi Coral to me felt abstract, completely abstract. I had no inclination that I was building up a city. I was just drafting cards, rolling dice, and drafting more cards. Whereas Valeria, I actually find quite thematic from having different types of heroes and building a party and going on adventures and picking which dungeon to explore and killing monsters to eventually building up enough income and money to found strongholds. Like to me, that really feels like old school D and D vibe to me. Like it just has that feel of like you start off weak and you build a big party and the whole founding strongholds was just such a big aspect of old school D and D. Now space base manages to feel somewhat thematic. I like, I really liked the, the mechanic of purchase dock and deploy. Like it just kind of makes sense. It fits thematically. I'm buying a ship. It's docking at my space station. Well, it's there. It generates stuff on my turn. because it's my station. And then it eventually they leave the dock and go out into space. And now it generates stuff on other players. turn. Like that just kind of fits. And honestly, the theme doesn't get in the way. It's, it's just there. Yeah. I would say despite the rule books flourish of background, it yes. does lean more towards the themeless Machi Koro. But again, not in a bad way. It's a sci-fi game. You don't need it dripping with theme and story in every action. Uh, that really does lend itself more toward the fantasy uh, mm -hmm. concepts. Uh, whereas, again, you know, sci-fi tends to be a little more stark anyway. Yeah. Now, another aspect that feels very different is the handling of resources. Machi Koro has one resource, coins, which are going to come and go and get passed all over the place chaotically. Space Base features currency that needs to be regenerated every turn, but that can be improved through upping your income, which can't be stolen by any other players. Valeria, on the other hand, is actually a game about having piles and piles of three different resources. So many that there are times five and times 10 counters included in the base game because you won't have enough counters to keep track. And you can buy individual counter packs separately to add to your game if you don't want to use those. Now, where Space Base and Machi can be about scarcity at the beginning of the game, Valeria is all about hoarding. Now, another aspect that just got brought up in our chat room that I think is really good to point out to is Valeria of the three games is the only one with a static market. So that's more like a Dominion. You put out which heroes are out at the beginning of the game and they stay there and your dungeon decks are the same. The only thing that's randomized are the kingdom cards that come up. So that is a big change between that one. In that case, Space Base and Valeria are very similar with that Splendor-like market where you have, or Gizmos uses the same thing, where you have different tiers, and when you purchase a card, you replace it from a new one on the deck. Now, all of these things, to me, make for three very different feeling games that just happen to use some similar but not identical mechanics. And no crazy grammatically questionable end game scoring in Space Base compared to Valeria. Yeah, Sean did not like the end game scoring for adding up resources. And the only reason we know is the designer told us how to read the cards properly. So yes, that is a bit of a failure of the game. Now, I'm sure everyone wants to know, what, what's my favorite, right? So of the three, I love Larry Card Kingdoms. I don't expect that to change. I, I think that is a fantastic game. I love the theme. I have almost all the expansions except for the latest Kickstarter. I love exploring new dungeons and throwing new monsters in and trying out different combinations of heroes. And there is a way to play if you own multiple heroes to shuffle the decks together so you have different numbers in so you do have that variable market. But I also really like Space Base. It's just not quite there. Now, based on some of the hype I've been seeing in regards to the expansions, I have a feeling there might be a chance that Space Base will just step past Valeria for me. 
but it's not there with the base box. It's just almost there. Maybe with the expansions, I'm, I'm going to put it above, but we'll have to see when we get to those. Now, as for Machi Koro, I'll admit it. I don't actually enjoy it. I did not have fun playing Machi Koro. I didn't like that one at all. It was far too random and way too cutthroat for our taste. Too much stuff just passing around, and when you feel like you're building up an engine, someone screws you over, and I did not enjoy that. Now, as for you, I, I would recommend doing what I did and try all three if you can. Go to a local game store, go to a cafe when it's safe, and, and try to try all three of the games. Then you can decide which game's best for your group. Heck, you might like all three and own them all. I will say none of these games have killed the others for me. I, in no way did Space Base kill Valeria. I am very happy to own both. And I'm glad I got to try Machi Koro, but I didn't buy that myself. I got to try someone else's copy, and it's just not one for me. Well, that's it for our look at Space Base. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so the big thing that happened this past weekend that I want to focus on here tonight is that Sean came down to Windsor for his grandfather's 100th birthday, and we managed to hook up and play some games before he had to head back to Hamilton. Now, before we get to the games, happy 100th, Grandpa Stevens. He probably can't hear you over the lawnmower or some power tool he's working with in the basement, but I will pass on the thanks. I don't know if he managed to get the 100 cards he was hoping for, but he was well <laughs> over 50 before the block party they threw for him even started. But since I was down to celebrate his birthday, and I hate driving to Windsor and back in a single day, mm -hmm. what a better time to game. So up uh, first, the first game we sat down and played um, was kind of random how this happened, it is a game of Riff Raff. This is a dexterity game from Zoc that I just happened to pick up that day. And it happened to be sitting out on the table, and I kind of wanted to check it out. Uh, now, Riff Raff, I played many years ago, Jamie's copy, actually, and I understood fully why Jamie was getting rid of this game, because this is one of the most frustrating to assemble games I've ever played before. Though, honestly, it wasn't quite as bad as I remembered. I remember really fighting with it. We did have to fight with it for quite a bit. And this is a game where you have this, like, cardboard water spout that you actually build a gimbal on top of with a wooden ship, and you have to then add the mast and add all the bits. But it was getting the, the, the cardboard stand part was just terrible, trying to get that together. Now... The game, I remember being extremely frustrating for a, for, for a dexterity game. And I remember playing with Jamie and being like, well, every time you put stuff on, it just falls off. And because you put it on one side and it tips because you put the thing and it falls off. And now there's nothing on that side. So it tips back the other way and everything falls off the other side. And I got to say, thankfully, that didn't happen this time. I, I, I think we figured something out. So I am starting to think that this may be a game and I'm going to compare a dexterity game to one of the heaviest games out there, a game like container that requires the players to kind of work together at the beginning and then expand out and try to win. Because what it seems like you need to do on this game is to put some weight on the base on the ship itself. You need to put some stability there before you start building up into the mass and tipping things. And I honestly think we missed that when I played it before with Jamie, that like we were just trying to put like, I don't know, we were trying to put the treasure chest on the nine mast on the first turn or something. So it was actually way better than I remember. Now I kind of got it just because I've somehow become a collector of dexterity games as, as the years go on, I like them more and more. I'm enjoying more and more. And this one's just, it's, it's a, a well-known wooden dexterity game with great production quality that i didn't own so i mainly wanted it for that but then playing with sean the other day i'm like no this is also good it's just you got to get that beginning thing where you add a little weight to the middle before you start trying to explore out i am really looking forward to bringing this out in public like th this is going to be a, a catch people's attention thing especially extra life like we're, like we're, I don't I don't know if there's a way to cheat in this game but like we're gonna have to charge entry fee to play this because i think people are going to want to touch it yeah, this game is solid. Well, not from a physical standpoint. It's really wobbly in that, in fact. Mm -hmm. But while not quite as much fun as Hamster Roll to me, it's loads better than Junk Art. And again, it really just looks fantastic and, and really eye-catching. 
and then the ship moves well like like it's it's wobbly in a neat way like you get a definite oh, yeah. like a, a ship at sea wobble back and forth I, I know i dig it the mechanics are better than i remembered like the actual everyone starts with the same player number of cards and there's actually some strategy there which is something that's a bonus right compared to some dexterity games some thoughts required not only just in what places you place but who places first and it's neat it is a really solid game so i am really glad i picked that up thanks jamie for getting rid of it Sorry, our original experience was so bad. Maybe now he'll uh, now now will be jealous and be like, "Oh, maybe I need to try it again." <laughs> now the reason I bought we played Riff Raff was because literally I, I bought it that day and it was out on the table and Deanna was busy. So once we I moved Riff Raff out of the way and thanks Sean for playing. So that that was probably the quickest the game went on the pile of shame and then off like like within an hour and a half. So that one was impressive. So that's cool. The next thing we did is I we decided to go to the, the game's Sean Must playlist, which we built up over our last few podcast episodes since the pandemic started. And the top game on that list was Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy. So I broke that out um, after sorting through all the bits, having not played in over two years. It took me a while to quite remember where everything goes. And a not-too-brief rule review, um, we crack that one open and we got to playing three player games so deanna joined us for this one so it was all three of us um i played the yellow alien race deanna played the white alien race and sean played one of the humans i think the blue but it doesn't matter all the humans are the same now i've talked about this one before mostly i want to hear sean's thoughts on this because this is his first big 4x game and i'll say right up i love this game this is this is still my favorite sci-fi 4x but what do you think yeah, so uh, aside from 4X sci-fi with tons of cool components, I admit I really didn't know too much about this game going in. Mm. Uh, of course, a 4X sci-fi with tons of cool components is a good enough reason for me to play the game, yep. but I didn't really know that much more. So I was worried we were going to start and end our night on some no. TI-like long haul. No. Uh, and at three players, it really wasn't. It wasn't fast, but it didn't feel like you were slogging along. Um, the number, number of potential paths to victory is a great aspect of this game. Um, and again, that's a, a much like a, in the same reason I liked um, uh, 2080 or 2048. All-Star 2849. 2849. Uh, it's that, you know, everyone can play their own game and it's not like you're ignoring each other, but you're not all fighting for that same uh, path. You know, you're all not trying to do mm. that one thing better than anyone else. You can just run your empire in your own way, um, unless you want to do delivery stuff. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, no, no, no commerce. No right. commerce in this game. Uh, but you can you can take your empire down that track and see if it's a path to victory. Uh, I think the only real negative I felt for the game was that depending on how technologies come out of the bag, it can shift that balance or in early game. Mm -hmm. um though i suspect less so the more everyone's familiar with the game right you can if you can find some mm -hmm. ways to compensate for oh there was only one of those in the first six rounds of the game and you got it round one that was uh you know that feels like it, it can it can change things or it did change things for our game yeah I can see that to a point uh one of the things i do find in that game is usually by the end of the game all the texts are there like because there are so many duplicates of the same technologies and multiple copies of them that usually stuff's always there but like our entire game we never got the the planetary bombing i can't remember what's called neutron bombs or whatever mm -hmm. to nuke a planet to remove the cubes it just never came up the whole game so it does change it but i actually like it to me it's a feature because it stops players from i buy this then i buy this then i buy this then i do this and i do this and i win every game by having the technologies randomize you don't get that Right. Like you can't do a heavy missile strategy if no missiles come out. And to me, that's a feature. But yes, there are certain ones that I wouldn't say are key, but can be more powerful than others. But that's also combined with what sectors you explore. If you get a whole bunch of sectors with stars on them, you're going to want those technologies that let you settle those stars. Whereas if you don't draw any of those, you don't care about those technologies. So knowing them does help, though. Knowing what you're going to want and what you're going to need is a big part of the game. And that's just familiarity. Yeah, like if I had been able to compensate for not having, uh, you know, certain things or one thing I would that would have drastically changed things is for me, if the yellow uh, advanced feature, whatever the mining or whatever currency. is, currency advance hadn't dropped 
you know, even if it had dropped one turn later, yeah. that could have sunk me a lot because of what, what came up around me. Yeah. Uh, so, but part of that too, I think is you not knowing the game, whereas you could have just kept exploring a lot more to find yeah. more yellow planets that didn't have stars on them to know you needed to compensate. We, while you didn't really know how valuable money can be, but it ends up money is how many actions you can take. Like right. there's a lot of interactions there, but yeah, I can definitely see it. Now, after Eclipse, uh, which I think only took us two and a half hours to actually play, so it really wasn't all that yeah. long once we sat down. Setup's bad. There, there's a lot of components you need to set up, and it takes a ton of room. Like, I, 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 Space Base is a little tiny game compared to this one. Although I have to say, now that I've played it and set it up once, you know the fact that we can each set up our own things without having to rely on you every time will yeah. take, some, take some time off that. Yeah, because generally I can just be like, here, here's your tray, here's your right. tray, here's your, which is how it's designed. I got to say, top notch for the, the game trays do do a great job of organizing everything. It's just a lot of stuff to put out on yeah, the board. Yeah, there's just, no matter, trays or not, there's just a lot yeah. of bits. Oh, being able to, the, the one thing that makes this game worth purchasing if you own the original is just the game tray for the technologies. That alone, to me, made the entire Kickstarter worth it. Just to be able to pick up the text and just hand them to someone else and have them all organized by price. All right, enough about Eclipse. We then went to, honestly, the next game on the list, which I didn't realize I was doing it that close to the, the order that I had on it because we were, we were downstairs. I didn't have access to my Google Drive, but it ends up it was the next game on the Sean Must playlist, and that is the Quacks of Quedlinburg. Now, the interesting thing I really like about this game is that it is a joy to teach. The way the theme integration works like uh, the way the mechanics are easy to explain because they just kind of make sense even though really it's an abstract strategy game but it's one of those you're like and you're going to put in these cherry bombs to make your potion more fizzy because you're you're a quack right you're trying to sell it and it looks more impressive but if you add too much it'll explode although i still disagree with the term cherry bombs but in a, that the, maybe we'll bring that up if we ever do a fish <laughs> a formal review or even the, the catch-up mechanic of well you're going to sneak some rat tails in there to thicken up your pot and i just and this is going to improve this it makes your pot thicker and you want a thicker brew and like it just all it makes sense right you're like i'm adding eye of newt and i'm adding this and this to try to get these effects i think this game went great um I, the thing that amused me the most is we're sitting there and i explained the rules and we're about to play and sean said something like this game's just too nice like it just it's it's too friendly i i i can't remember the exact quote but it was something like that yeah, yeah maybe it says more about the games that i've been playing than quacks in particular but the idea that people are sharing bonuses like everyone can roll the dice if you get all you get the same yeah. And there's that built-in mechanic to help people not fall too far behind with the rat mm -hmm. tails, as well as any sort of lack of take that aspect just made it feel more wholesome than, than so many games that tend to get to the table these days. Yeah, the game about trying to steal snake oil to the populace in medieval times is more wholesome than most other games we've been playing. I thought that was an interesting observation. I hadn't really caught that myself. I do really dig that game though. Like that, that's up there. That, that space base, like uh, uh, my, my, my top 50 game list is going to change a lot this year. <laughs> now, speaking of space base, which we talked about a lot earlier, um, that was our final game on the list. And again, right on the next on the list. So that was kind of amusing. Next time Sean comes down, we're playing Garinto apparently, cause that's the next one on the list. Um, this, this one as well as I expected, um, what was notable about this is something I brought up in the review earlier is I really liked it with three players. It just seemed to flow, seemed to be a sweet spot for me compared to playing with four. Now, maybe it was playing with four with my girls who do have, uh, my girls really like to plan ahead and that's not really a game you can plan ahead in. So there were some AP issues. So maybe that's it. Excuse me. But I definitely dig it so far with the people I've been able to play with. Space Base with three is my favorite. Now, I know many people online have mentioned that it's more fun with more players, but with the use of the expansions. Now, I know I don't want to spoil anything on Shy Pluto like other people have for me, but I know there's stuff, more stuff that will happen when it's not your turn with that. So that is one of the things that, that may make it more interesting at higher player counts and keep you involved. Now, I haven't cracked those myself. So what do you think of the base game? So I, I really enjoyed it. Now, I was probably a bit too tired to play it as optimally as I should have, being our last game of the night. Though, mm. given how deep played, I don't think it would have mattered. No. Uh, definitely a fun game. And maybe um, 
in lieu of in person. We can see how it plays on Tabletop Simulator because I really would like to give it more tries. Now, is that one that you think would go over well with your kids? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm going to wait. I'm going to have until, to try Valeria. Yeah, let's yeah. wait until I, I get Valeria to the table. I'm hoping to do that possibly even tomorrow. Um, cool. And we'll uh, we'll see. I got I to gotta do a quick read through because it's been a while since I've played Valeria. Um, and, and especially with just base. I mean, I don't know if I've ever played it without all of some expansions or yeah it probably always stuff. had something in there um so so yeah o- overall uh, that was just fun like like saturday night we haven't done that in a long time it just felt really good gaming in person with people who aren't my immediate family not that i don't love my family but <laughs> i've been stuck playing with them for a year and a half it was nice to have someone else at the table and play some and share some games that i really like like that was the other part of the night too right like we just took three games that are, are probably my top games of all time and i'm like showing them off and that just I, I love doing that right that's part of what got me into this i i love being an ambassador for the games i love and i got to do that with sean so that was awesome and i'm looking forward to that happening more frequently as uh things start opening up and and also i mean it's it's somewhat not selfish but it's nice for me to be able to talk about space space in a review today because i've actually played it right i actually got the chance to experience and it's i'm not just sort of bouncing along following what pictures i've seen or what i've seen online i've actually held the cards and played them um Mm. uh, and i'm able to you know uh, contribute to the review more than as just a uh, guy asking questions based on stuff you've said <laughs> or, or what it says on board game geek yeah you got a lot of very like yeah people on board game geek seem to complain about have you seen that which works that's valid yeah. but yeah that's something to look forward to hopefully in the future i'm probably gonna have to um assuming you'll be able to get down more regularly put some stuff on the back burner just so you can experience <laughs> it before we talk about it right. Well, and now that shots are happening, provinces are reopening, we can hopefully do this less than, you know, once or yeah. twice a year. That'd be nice. <laughs> uh, now, besides playing games with Sean and Deanna, I did get in some gaming with the kids. Uh, for Father's Day, I sat down and I introduced them to Quacks of Ludenberg. Uh, They both liked it, but didn't love it. I, I was expecting more of a, oh, this is fun, and it, it didn't quite get there. Now, they did think it was neat and interesting. Um, they do want to play again. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, they do want to play again, but my youngest found it a little overwhelming. Just trying to figure out what all the different ingredients do. I don't remember how many there are. There's like 11 ingredients or nine. There's there's a lot of different ingredients in that game. And I off the top of my head. And yes, you only add two of them later, but like you add one in round two and the other in round three. It's not like they don't come out until the sixth and seventh round. So it's just a lot of different things and her trying to remember what they do. And the other problem is my oldest is really jonesing to play more Disney villainous and her little sister didn't like that. So she just spent the whole game going, you know, can't we play Disney next? And my youngest going, no, I don't like Disney, you know? And so I think she just had Disney on her brain. So I think she would have more fun playing quacks next time. I have a feeling this is one that once they play it a couple more times, get to memorize what the ingredients do. Like probably for the next few games, I'd still stick to the one books and not switch over to the other sides or the other cards just to get it so that they memorize what those cards do. I think it's going to grow on them. I think they're going to enjoy it more and more. I, I will admit, I was sort of taken aback at the quantity of ingredients and what they all did. But I mm-hmm. found, for me at least, once you start playing it does sort of move, move smoothly once you've read them over that first time you buy them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's where that the AP for most players is going to happen is that first time, the first mm-hmm. couple of buy sessions when you're just learning all the different, uh, the cards the first time. And then in your next few rounds, you know, the next, uh, you know, once you, once they're even, even as you add cards, as long as you've read the other ones uh, thoroughly, mm-hmm. it moves much more quickly. One thing I, do, I wish they did is they gave you one book that explains what all the cards do. Why not have one of those for every player mm-hmm. or some kind of shorter summary that just shows, I don't, I don't know how short you could make it because some do require a pretty detailed explanation, but even just something that showed the icons so that again, I have a big table. So depending on eyesight issues, it may be hard to see what those cards are. I will say I successfully got a, again, we're using the one books, a mushroom, a mushroom pumpkin combo to work really well. I've always avoided those before because they always seem to come out in the wrong order, but there was a couple things that gave me free pumpkins. And then I'm like, forget it. I'm going to start trying mushroom pumpkins. Oh, I had some of the thickest pots I've ever had. (laughs) And um, I did end up winning the game, but honestly, my oldest daughter should have, she exploded three times and 
I think could should have took victory points when she decided to go shopping. I think she should have had that game. Right. But it was neat that I'd try a new strategy and have it work. Excellent. Uh, now, finally, we have been doing some online gaming, including all the stuff we've been playing forever. Uh, the big one we've been checking out now is Hardback on Board Game Arena, which I, I think it's in beta right now, or maybe I don't, it feels like it's in beta. It's, <laughs> it's weird. So one of the things you do when playing Hardback that's strongly recommended in the game to keep you engaged and speed up play is to plan out what words you're going to make while it's the other players are going. So you have your hand of cards and you're rearranging your cards and you're getting ready and you're you're spending your ink and drawing more cards while other players are going, right? It's, it's great for at the table. Well, Board Game Arena is set up to do this, but it assumes you're doing this. So when it's on your turn, it tries to help by putting all your cards on the table in whatever order they last were. Now, this would be great if you were actually playing on other people's turns, but like this is Board Game Arena, what are you, turn-based, right? Like, I, I can't think of the turn. It's not pass and play. It's turn-based, yeah. yeah. Turn-based. We're playing turn-based, right? So, like, generally, I'm board game, I take my turn and I leave. You know, I, I go do something else on my PC or I move over to our game of Terra Mystica, which I might win this. We'll see. Depends if I get to build the one thing I'm hoping I get to build. We'll see. But I, it just, I, I find it actually really annoying. Now, if you're playing simultaneously, it would work. Like, if we were playing real-time instead of turn-based, I think it'd be fantastic. But like, it's just kind of annoying. Like you, you sit there and you start your turn. I'm like, why are they played on the table? And I assume everyone else can see them. So then I'm going to feel dumb if I don't smell a big enough smell, spell a big enough word. Because <laughs> then I'd be like, you saw your cards. And you're going, oh, well, why didn't you spell this? I, I don't know. I like, I, it just bugs me. Plus the, the way it uses the ink is kind of strange. I, I don't know. The interface on this one, like it's a deck builder and it doesn't feel like I'm playing a deck builder at all. Now... I, it seems like it's a good implementation, but it's just this is going to take more time than usual, I think, to learn to play. I almost feel like I'm playing on Tabletop Simulator again, where I'm like <laughs> flipping the wrong cards. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm not what what I don't get, and because I've never played the game before in person, uh, and unfortunately, the the rule watch I I watched wasn't from my favorite. Uh, it was from somebody else completely different, um, because uh, Paul hasn't done a. Uh, a video on this one apparently but i don't understand what is over in the scoring side like i, I get the deck the, the word building and and I'm, right. and I'm starting to get the buying but the stuff over on the score thing doesn't really make much sense to me there's all these extra circles and things and and i don't know they yeah i just, might have to find another video or something i know yeah. some of it's your ink and your ink remover yeah and, the ink and the ink remover are obvious enough but and you but know the other thing i think is stuff you can buy I oh, think you okay. purchased them. You spend a big ton of money to get a bunch of points, as if I remember yeah, correctly. Literary, liter, literary awards and adverts. Yeah, I, I honestly, don't even know what you those know, are. It's been a while <laughs> since I played too, so yeah. I just kind of ignored them because I've been fighting with the interface so much that I'm just trying to spell words and actually get some money. One of my one of my favorite parts of a game is, unlike most games, they actually have an FAQ that comes up in the default view that specifically yes. tells you uh, don't report this as an error you just because you got the wrong word choose your dictionary more carefully because this is a there's like eight different dictionaries you can choose from oh and you get so, to pick it when we started the game i i don't know if it's that or if it's it's it, but I, if, if it doesn't like your dictionary it, or if it doesn't like your word it's because it's not in one of these dictionaries sort of thing so don't okay. don't report that as an error and don't file it as a bug if you're running on windows 98 in, <laughs> in ie <laughs> So apparently it, it, you know, it uses like I said, the, it feels like it's in beta. I'm, I'm not sure if it is. They now I, I seem to remember it being released, but no. I don't know. I just happened across it. I don't even remember what we were doing. And I was like, oh, this is the Sean likes deck builders. And this is a very different deck builder, which is why I wanted to showcase it. I'm like, here's doing deck something new with deck building. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, uh, and you and we pointed out before the show you weren't sure yeah. the, about you thought you had to pull them back but you can actually rearrange them on the table so yes uh that was something we both mistake uh made a mistake of yeah, I, just I thought we had out. to pick up well because i said it automatically puts all your cards on the table i'm like no i haven't even looked at them yet because yeah. i went away now i know though is i should finalize my word and then play with my letters but yeah so yeah it, what, it's, a, it's it's a it's a move then roll uh sorry <laughs> yes <laughs> there you go 
All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right, so the, the big focus right now is getting things back on track with the blog and YouTube. Um, actually, I did a lot of work on that today, uh, getting some stuff up on Amazon and on Board Game Geek with some of our videos. Uh, but basically, we took a week and a half off uh, to focus on tabletop gaming deals and recovering from um, the vaccine. So I need to get back on track and on schedule with the rest of our content. So one of the things we need to do is get your... Um, Blood Bowl video out. I think we'll try the, the Blood Bowl review. We'll try to get out this week and then space space for next week. But like we didn't even put out an unboxing this week, which is rare. Oh, we, we didn't? usually oh, shoot. no, <laughs> we didn't even put out an unboxing this week. Yeah, so yeah. we just need to get caught up. Now, as for gaming, hopefully we can fit in sometime, maybe on the weekend. Like I said, it's gonna plus I we kind of need a day off. I think Deanna and I may take Thursday off in general. Uh, doing a little less than usual just to kind of take a break after the last few days like we had some 24-hour nights there so well and we we talked about even possibly doing some uh rpg or uh online gaming gaming yep uh, yep so. I, and that's i need to confirm with you which we might as well do here do you have the game of the year enhanced edition or just the game of the year that edition? is a good question. and i don't know if they're compatible so oh. i bought mine through the humble bundle and i got both Ah, okay. But so I would know, prefer to, to play the enhance. So I need I, to know which one you have. Yeah, that is a good question. So I noticed that today when I was cleaning stuff on my computer. I'm like, why do I have two copies of Borderlands? <laughs> so Sean's never played through Borderlands, and I never finished it. And I know it's dated at this time. But yeah. All right. Deanna wants us to move on. All righty. So yeah, mm -hmm. gaming, who knows? Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. I would like to welcome Donna, the latest tabletop bellhop patron. Thank you, Donna. Courtney Jackson, keep those topics coming. Matt Lichtenwaller. Thank you, Matt. Roger Malosh, we are so close to being able to game together again. Looking forward to gaming with you. In person again. We need to get him on tabletop simulator. I know he has tabletop simulator and stuff. And Zopi, thank you for supporting us. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to drop that portcullis. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Actually, if I remember correctly, Deanna would have to confirm this. I think there is now a new bonus for people subscribing to our new newsletter. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sunday's for brunch restarting this week. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.